Hello everybody, and welcome to Drydock episode number 39. Just a very short bit of channel admin today, and that's to say that since the weather in the UK is unusually good for this time of year, with the sky turning a deeply unnatural shade of the colour blue, I may or may not interrupt a regularly scheduled five minute guide or special to bring you some form of live guide or special from one of the various museum ships or other locations around the UK if I get the chance over the next few upcoming weekends and uh, whether that's uh, something in the Portsmouth Historic Dockyard, the Belfast or maybe Chatham Dockyards or something similar I don't know yet we'll just have to see but yeah that may be upcoming at some point in the future and maybe the next two three weeks anyway on with questions so first of all, the two videos we're looking at this week in terms of specific Q&A are the County Class Guide and Last Stand of the Revenge. Uh, Last Stand of the Revenge, obviously taken from the book Against the Odds. Uh, that is a uh, picture above as per normal. So let's go on with the questions from that video. Nathaniel Poole asks, when was the transition from galleon to ship of the line or man of war? So the classic galleon with a very high forecastle and aftercastle and a significant emphasis on boarding actions with occasional use of broadside guns, that ship saw its heyday in the, well, what in the UK would be the Tudor period, so we're talking 15th and 16th centuries. Towards the end of the 16th century, it was already in decline. Um, the, at the time of the Spanish Armada, you had the what were called the race-built galleons, which uh, had significantly lower castles and much more emphasis on gunnery. Um, and the English developed that line of uh, thought. Obviously, revenge, the subject of this particular that particular video, was a race-built galleon. The Spanish galleons, still obviously being much larger, uh, physically could board well try to obviously um but yeah so the, the galleon kind of hung around for a while with the race built galleon other people gradually began adopting their own versions of the race built galleon and then as you went forward from the sort of 1500s so the 16th century into the 1600s uh, thus the 17th century you <clears throat> began to see an evolution of tactics so you had what had been the race-built galleon, the network also called the Great Ship or the Large Ship or something of that effect. Everyone had their own names for it, often various competing designations even within uh, the same country. So some of them were even called royal ships, although confusingly a royal ship was also any royal sh any ship in royal service, which could be a small ship as well. So have fun with that. Um, you also saw the, the frigates, and again, not what we would have called frigates these days. These were, as I said in the video on the Medway, uh, these were more kind of what we would think of in the classic age of sailors third rate and fourth rate ships um at the time this basically meant single deck but still able to stand in the main uh, battle and then during the anglo-dutch wars progressively through first the second and third um with the sort of the culminate with most of the tactics coming to the fore in the second particularly you saw the development from the galleon and frigate through to the ship of the line basically because they have ended line of battle tactics and started using them the main change in this respect as you probably saw from some of the pictures wasn't that the forecastle dropped all that much that was for later on it was more about the dimensions of the ship and i think i've mentioned before that the idea of capital ships before probably the, the main development of the Second Anglo-Dutch War, was that they would have a fair battery of stern guns, a fair battery of chase guns and broadsides, and the tactics tended to be a little bit more pell-mell and more along the lines of sail, to a point where you were comfortable shooting at the enemy, um, shoot at him with your forward guns, and then start basically doing giant circles. So as you came to bear with your port or starboard guns, you'd fire off your broadside, you'd then complete your turn, fire your stern guns, come around and fire whichever broadside you hadn't fired already, and hopefully by the time you completed a full circle you were back up with your four guns, and so you'd effectively just do a little cartwheel of death. Um, you could obviously, if you wanted to, try and close in um, 
too bored, or you could, especially in the sort of the hundred plus ship battles that characterise the Anglo-Dutch Wars, um, you could end up just wandering generally through the enemy line, firing at anything in any direction possible. Um, Sovereign of the Seas being particularly good at that little tactic. Um, but with the line of battle coming around, because you weren't firing so much with your fore and aft guns, you wanted more and more of the gun your guns on the broadside, and since going up and up and up with heavy guns meant ships were very unstable and prone to falling over, uh, see the Vassa for that one, um, you would then instead lengthen your ship. This also made them a little bit faster, but the primary point of lengthening the ship was it meant your broadside got longer and longer, but obviously proportionally your fore and aft firepower became less and less, to the point that eventually by the classic age of sail period, chase guns and stern guns were effectively just to try and sort of snipe at the enemy and keep them, keep them off your tail as, until you could bring your broadside to bear. So, yeah, transition from galleon to ship of the line you're probably looking at the mid 1600s um the ships that go into the first the anglo-dutch war is actually a very good metric for this because the ships that go into the first anglo-dutch war are very definitely still heavily influenced by the old style of uh, galleon style fighting and race built galleon style fighting um the ships that fight the second anglo-dutch war very rapidly evolve into line of battle tactics and by the time of the third anglo-dutch war it is full-on line of battle so yeah mid 1600s probably over a period of i want to say 30 or 40 years um yeah you look at a ship of say 1630 and look at a ship of 1670 1680 and you can see that although things like the stern dressing and stuff might not have changed the overall design of the ship and their use has shifted dramatically Thel Vadami, there's a name I haven't seen for a while in the comments, says, You sound like the mighty Jingles. All I can say to that is, uh, poor old Jingles. Getting himself compared to me, truly the mighty are falling. <laughs> Josh Thomas Moore asks, How much authority does an admiral have over their flagship? As I've read of a couple of captains overruling their admiral's orders. So is it the case the captain is responsible for the ship, whilst the admiral is responsible for the fleet? There's no firm answer to this question, as it's going to vary wildly by Navy, and also by the kind of engagement that's being fought. But generally speaking, one would hope there wouldn't be too much of a clash, um, because normally if you've got an Admiral on board, that means there's a fleet to supervise, and really speaking, an Admiral should be worrying about the disposition of the fleet, the understanding being the Captain is always master of his own ship. So, in general... If an admiral is trying to give specific orders to about this a specific ship, i.e. his flagship, doing a specific manoeuvre or something, he's probably not doing his job of supervising the entire fleet. Um, the situation that you cite in your full question about uh, the Bismarck, uh, its captain and admiral obviously having clashes, something of a unique situation, as once Prince Eugen had been ordered to detach, uh, the Bismarck was a fleet of one, so a little bit of a unique special situation there. Um, as I say, d depending on the Navy, in some navies, uh, the Admiral, as the highest ranking officer on board, would be his word is law and he'd have to be proven unfit. Um, but in other navies, it may be the case that there's either a silent or possibly even a written understanding that day to day operations of the ship belong solely within the purview of the captain, and the Admiral's orders only countermand his as far as overall dispositions of the fleet go. So, for example, uh, an Admiral might say, Take the fleet over there, and the ship has to comply. But the Admiral wouldn't be standing over the captain's shoulder going, I want you to alter your course three degrees this way, four degrees that way, half a knot up, half a knot down, etc. But, as I say, circumstances and navies vary. Erpy Derpy asks, what was the biggest secondary gun used in World War II? Well, by a whole three millimetres, at least amongst the uh, the bigger navies, France, Germany, Italy, UK, Japan and the USA, the biggest secondary gun that was in, used, in use was the 155 millimetre or 6.1 inch 60 calibre gun, mount, which was uh, used by the Japanese Navy. Uh, originally on the Megami class as triple uh, 6.1 inch main batteries, but then moved over to the Yamato class 
as their initial secondary battery. So yeah, that's the, the biggest secondary gun in use in World War II, although I say only by three millimeters. And David Knowles asks, did the heavy losses incurred by the New Orleans class cruisers is it New Orleans or New Orleans? I don't know. Anyway, um, show any sort of weakness in the design or were they just in the wrong place at the wrong time? Well, you've got seven ships in the class and you can see where your question's coming from because, uh, yeah, three of them are sunk and three others are heavily damaged. Um, only one of them gets through the war pretty much unscathed. That said, um, the three that were lost, Astoria, Quincy and Vincennes, had the misfortune to be at the Battle of Savo Island. Now, whilst it has to be said that US interwar cruisers did not have the world's best torpedo protection, uh, they also had a very slightly weird habit of losing entire portions of the ship and then just sailing off with whatever was left for, and surviving implausibly large distances um, use it with basically a fraction of the ship they used to have. But anyway, um, yeah, look at let's look at the losses. Astoria... Poor old Astoria. It it got attacked by four heavy cruisers at once. I mean, it's kind of sim like the similar question that was asked about the county class. I don't think there's much really of any heavy cruiser in the world that's going to survive a four-on-one pounding by um, enemies, especially at night at, th at this point in the war when the Japanese are really much in the ascendancy as far as night fighting goes. Um, so, yeah, I don't think you can say there was any design flaws that caused Astoria's losses. Likewise, the Quincy, it was in a three-on-one fight and managed to get hit by three torpedoes. Again, I cannot see any realistic heavy cruiser of the Second World War surviving that particular engagement. Um, although, I must note, although both ships were very rapidly overwhelmed, both of them managed to land hits on Chikai, which seems to be the US Navy's beat stick amongst uh, Japanese cruisers. And then likewise you have Vincennes, although Vincennes gets off slightly lighter than the other two, it still takes um, a couple of torpedo hits and then and uh, is in a two-on-one fight only, and then gets ganged up on by the rest of the Japanese once they've sunk some of the other um, US ships. So yeah, I don't think any of the New Orleans class losses in the Battle of Savo Island can be said to be particularly down to any kind of design failure so much as uh, don't take on the enemy on their terms in a near ambush situation and then get hit by multiple long lances. But as I say, that's advice that you don't you really want to give to everybody. <laughs> now, as for the ships that were damaged, San Francisco actually, to be honest, is probably a testament to the build quality of the class um, because it took on an entire battleship, Kirishima, plus uh, the Nagara, which was a cruiser and not a not an insignificant combatant in and of itself, albeit it was a light cruiser, plus a destroyer. It took multiple hits, and yes, it got beat up, but what do you expect? Again, it's a three-on-one fight, except now one of them's a battleship. Um, San Francisco made it out of that fight and managed to get repaired and um, put back in to service, so yeah, good for it. New Orleans, of course, at Tassanfaronga gets its entire bow blown off, as we kind of hinted at earlier, See, now this is where you could make an argument about design faults, because as a heavy cruiser, it uh, yes, okay, okay, fair enough, the torpedo got hit with was quite powerful, but it shouldn't at that size have had its bow blown completely off, so you could argue that's actually a poor construction dash design. But on the other hand, as we mentioned earlier as well, it made it back, so shoot the people who designed its torpedo protection and maybe some of and its sort of a longitudinal structure but whoever designed its uh, horizontal structure and its bulkheads definitely would need the need deserves the medal of honor and minneapolis is well at the same battle near enough the same result except that minneapolis got to keep both of its forward turrets um, whereas new orleans didn't so yeah i'd say uh, overall the internal subdivision and watertight of the ships are probably excellent, well above average. Construction of the bow and the torpedo defense system, probably a little bit under average. Now for the county class video, um, sources for this include British Cruisers by Norman Friedman, plus the uh, obviously the uh, Nelson to Vanguard by D.K. Brown, both very good works, obviously the, uh, lat the former covering 
them in a fair bit more detail. There's also the book Cruisers of World War II, an encyclopedia, uh, again, appearing above if you need to know the exact title and author, with a few interesting details taken from the Imperial War Museum's Book of the War at Sea. Connor McLaren asks, what would have happened if Donitz had gotten his 300 U-boats prior to World War II? Well, first thing on everyone's mind post-war would have been which particular little time-travelling pipsqueak had given him either a industrial replicator from the Federation or a standard template contra constructor out of 40k, but never mind. Um, assuming that somehow he gets his hand on 300 U-boats, um, realistically, some of them are going to be coastal U-boats, which otherwise Germany just physically isn't going to be able to churn them out quite quickly enough, um, unless they just get scrap everything at, at other plan that they have for the Kriegsmarine. But anyway, um, yeah, it, his idea of can we shut down commerce to Britain quite possibly could have worked with that many U-boats uh, out there. I mean, you look at the um, issues he caused with what he did have. Um, so yeah, throw 300 U-boats out there right at the start and yeah quite possibly um britain will have some major problems quite whether or not they'll give up i mean obviously rationing will have to get a lot harsher um whether they take extreme measures like just instead of taking through like mega convoys with half the fleet escorting them or something i don't know um lots of active minefields That's, the british would have to respond in some way it's not just a case of oh look x number of extra merchant ship losses go up um but no, it's it certainly would be a, a bit of an interesting question. There is a there is a possibility Britain could be forced either out of the war or to terms um, just through sheer loss of uh, in, an interdiction of merchant shipping. Um, but it'd be an interesting scenario to put uh, significantly more thought into um, at some point in the future. Yubari asks, in a similar note, how effective were German U-boats after the so-called happy times? Were they effective threats in the closing years of the war, and how did various innovations affect their survivability? So, as to how effective, um, depended on the theatre. Um, U-boats moving around into new and unexpected theatres, like, say, the Mediterranean, always tended to score some rather spectacular results when they weren't, um, when people weren't looking for them. In terms of the general battle of the Atlantic, it seesawed um, for obvious reasons. Both sides were very, very determined to get one up on the other, and it was a constant game of move counter move. So, at the, I mean, the Happy Times were obviously the best for the U boats, but as Allied anti submarine warfare improved, so too did the U boats' ability to attack convoys. So, the, the U boats gradually got faster underwater, longer ranged. Um, they given for a period some relatively effective anti-aircraft firepower. The snorkels came along, which meant they didn't have to be on the surface. Then they had to take ra radar detectors. It, I say, it, it, their effectiveness went back and forth. So w what would happen is the Allies would come up with some kind of countermeasure. So let's say longer ranged aircraft. The U-boats would then either be issued with or come up with a countermeasure to the countermeasure. So either say, flat cannons on the U-boats, and then the Allies would start losing patrol aircraft, and so the U-boats could move around a bit a uh, bit less molested. Then the Allies would stick radar on the aircraft, so the U-boats would then event start to mount radar detectors so that they could dive in time. The Allied search aircraft got faster and the radar got longer, so they would invent snorkels, um, which allowed them to take on air without being surfaced. The Allied radar improved, which then meant that the surface escorts and the aircraft could see the snorkels, so eventually they went for things like the electric boats, and they were experimenting with hydrogen peroxide power and everything at the, toward the end of the war. And the same thing with the torpedoes. Um, the Allies got better at dodging torpedoes and fooling the magnetic detonators, so they invented acoustic torpe homing torpedoes and such like, and to which the Allies have deployed decoys, and so on and so forth. So um, of, if you look at a chart of ships lost, I mean, they, they were still effective. There were still a fair number of ships lost to uh, U-boats after 1941, including some fairly big ones. Um, but it, once you factor in the number of convoys and the weather, which is the other important thing, because remember U-boats, to a very great degree, still need their periscopes and thus decent weather to be able to actually spot attack, uh, spot ships and set up their attacks, until, at least until the acoustic torpedoes come in. Um, 
if once you factor in weather and merchant ship um, numbers that are physically present to attack, you will see there is still a sort of a otherwise unexplained kind of sine wave of more ships being sunk, less ships being sunk, more ships being sunk, less ships being sunk, and this is the um, the sort of the the back and forth between uh, measure and countermeasure. So they're still effective, albeit that they are having to resort to more and more specific and techniques to do so. Broken Soul asks, what uh, good did the Washington Naval Treaty do since Japan left? It seems to have mainly disadvantaged the UK. It did a certain amount of good. I mean, it did a tremendous amount of harm as well. It virtually destroyed um, a lot of naval dockyards, um, naval construction and design firms, and a lot of the specific support industry around uh, warship production simply by starving them of business and that had a massive much more massively negative effect on the british than it did on anybody else mainly because the more british were the ones with the biggest ship building warship building industry in the world at the time but hey ça la vie. um it's has been said and i've said in other videos that um it is the opinion of some historians that the Washington Naval Treaty probably did avert some kind of Anglo-American conflict in the late 1920s, and that is entirely possible. I mean, Anglo-American relations were certainly better after the First World War than they had been before, but um, America was still very much on its manifest destiny binge, and definitely there were aspects of the American Congress at the time that saw Britain as a major rival dash competitor for world domination and they wanted to redress that. I mean you had the fact that the 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 US Navy was determined to have well America as a whole was determined to have a US Navy that was second to none and the British were also determined to have the same thing um hence the G3 N3 South Dakota Lexington blah 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 etc ships that were being built in the 1920s um they weren't being built to counter Germany anymore they were very much going after each other everyone was kind of looking at Japan with a little bit of a sideways glance mainly trying to figure out how to leverage them onto their side um so yeah, as unbelievable as it sounds, it probably did actually prevent some kind of conflict. Whether they would have gone to full-out war or angry staring or small skirmishing or proxy war, who knows. But it also saved everyone's economies. Japan physically couldn't afford what it was going to be spending on its uh, revised date 8 plan. Uh, so yeah, that probably saved Japan from economic ruin, given what they then ended up getting up to in World War Two. One can argue whether this was a good or a bad thing. Um... The British economy could have sustained, if you look at the ship, pure numbers could have sustained the naval arms race that w was going on, at least at the level that they were building at at the time of the, the, the G3 and N3 getting cancelled. It wouldn't have been pretty, it wouldn't have been nice, it would have required a lot of hard choices, but unlike Japan, the British economy could actually afford it. They just have to do some rather unpopular prioritisation. The US economy had the most money and um obviously the far by far the least war debt so they were going all out with their construction on the flip side the lexingtons were of questionable value um but even there the u.s congress by the time the washington treaty came about were going whoa hold on a minute there the the, the cost estimates were going a little bit high even for u.s congress which at the time was at this slightly weird position of having come out of its isolationist bent, at least for a little while, now being determined that it wanted to be the, the number one power on the seas, but on the other hand still having a lot of lingering, we don't want to spend a cent more than we absolutely have to, um, which had characterised the pre-World War One US Navy to a great degree. So, um, yeah, they're a little bit weird. Well, that can't don't really think much has changed, but anyway, um, yeah. So even even the U.S. Navy was beginning to feel the penny pinching costs a little bit, um, not as much as the other two, obviously. So it 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 did a lot of good in saving everybody from a lot of, uh, to be fair, probably fairly pointless e um, economic damage, and it did regulate everybody for a while. I mean, the even Japan stuck to the treaty agreements until the sort of the mid 30s so it gave everyone a 15 year breather um at which point then japan left and as you say that was technically they left the london naval treaty rather than the washington one but there you go yeah so 
<laughs> overall, very long rambling ranty thing aside, uh, what good did it do? It basically gave everyone a 15 year pause and let their economies recover a bit. Um, I say that for Britain, that was certainly a good thing. For America, given what they actually ended up needing battleships for in the Second World War, um, and since it gave them the Lexington class carriers, that was probably also a good thing. Uh, saving Japan's economy from complete meltdown, as I said, given what they ended up actually getting up to in World War II, possibly a bad bit of a downside. Then again, um, final thought, if the Washington Naval Treaty hadn't come about, the Anglo-Japanese Naval Treaty probably would have stuck around and maybe the Japanese wouldn't have been quite as terrible as they actually were historically. Josh Thomas Moore asks, what ships in the Royal Navy could have fought the Yamato and Nagato classes? Well, I could be cheeky and say any of them could have fought them. Um, whether or not they've win is another matter entirely. Um, but getting to the spirit of the question, rather than just being snarky, um, the Nagato class, to be fair, I don't rate them that highly. They're, they're relatively quick and they're relatively well-armed, but their armour is pretty abysmal um, for... Uh, ship well actually for a ship of even pre World War One standards to be perfectly honest, um, the Nelson class certainly I think have a comfortable advantage over them and obviously the King George the Fifth assuming we're restricting it to ships that were actually in service at a time such that they could have actually fought um, Yamato and Nagato plausibly, um, so yeah King George the Fifth and the Nelsons quite comfortably, um, the Revenges are a bit too slow, the Queen Elizabeths. They certainly get hurt, but at the same time, um, the, over the refit Queen Elizabeths could certainly land a pretty nasty punch on the Nagato if they end up fighting them. Uh, I'd say there's no guarantee that they necessarily win, but um, they certainly stand a pretty good chance of laying the hurt in. Um, as far as the Yamato glass goes, well, it's a 70,000 ish ton battleship armed with 18 inch guns and you're talking about a navy that uh, until vanguard came along after after yamato and musashi had been sank um had not actually built a ship with a standard displacement over 35,000 tons except for hood and yeah i'm not taking hood up against uh, <laughs> uh yamato one one massive magazine explosion is plenty for one lifetime thank you very much um so yeah that no individual ship from the royal navy I don't think would go up against a Yamato class, except for, well, send a, a, an implacable class aircraft carrier. I'm sure Yamato will love that. Um, no, but in, in battleship terms, no, no single ship. Um, Nelson and Rodney sailing together, apart from the speed issue, um, probably have a reasonable chance of, of sort of making it combat ineffective um, or two or three of the King George the Fifth, but again, it just comes down to, well, two or three on one combat, really. Um, ideally, if I was going to take Royal Navy ships of the World War II period up against Yamato to be safe, I'd want to take three. But if you had to take two, any two, um, and guarantee that Yamato was going to come after them, I'd probably take Nelson and Rodney, um, purely for the fact they can minimise their target profiles and have some pretty nasty guns on their side. And now... Moving on to questions from various uh, other videos, sort of from the catch up further back. Um, Vault Boy asks, "What would a battle between a post fram gearing and a stock gearing look like?" Well, given that a stock gearing at the end of World War Two is configured almost primarily for anti-surface operations, whereas a post-fram gearing is configured a lot more for anti-submarine warfare, and a lot of the stuff that it's lost has been replaced with stuff that isn't particularly useful in fighting other destroyers, um, I'd actually give it to a stock gearing if you just put them one-on-one -on -one, 10 miles away and said go. Uh, because the, st the stock gearing has an awful lot more firepower that's useful in a surface engagement. And, um, yeah, the, f the, the post frame gearings, they're not from an era that's advanced enough for it to have things like harpoon missiles and such, which would obviously swing the, ba the battle the other way again. 
Will Rogers says that he's noticed a trend where secondary batteries are concerned in the Second World War, dividing Allied and Axis ships, namely that the Allies seem to have gone for a unified secondary battery calibre with all guns mounted in dual-purpose mounts, whereas Axis navies seem to have gone for two different calibres, uh, an anti-shipping calibre, a larger calibre, and the smaller calibre being dual-purpose AA and anti-surface. Could I please explain why? So a lot of it comes down to technology. The Americans, in a way, lucked out with a 5-inch 38. They had a much shorter caliber 5-inch gun for pure dedicated AA work and the much longer 5-inch 51 caliber for anti-surface work. So, well, at least it was still the same caliber, even if the guns themselves were of different lengths. Um, but they recognized in the development of the 5-inch 38 that a dual-purpose mount was better because, uh, as we'll get on to when you ask about the pros and cons, which you asked for, um, it, it made more sense to have a dual-purpose gun. Obviously, the 5-inch 38 wasn't quite as good at anti-surface combat as the 5-inch 51, and it wasn't quite as good as at AA work as the, the shorter calibre 5-inch gun, but it was pretty good at both. So... Uh, anyway, so there's that. Um, the British, <laughs> the British desperately wanted a similar weapon, but their attempt at a five-inch gun didn't work. Um, they knew that a four-inch didn't really have the punch, um, and this is why you see British uh, destroyers and, to some extent, some of their large ships as well have a whole range of. Sort of 4-inch guns, 4.5-inch guns, 4.7-inch guns, and of course the 5.25s, because they're desperately searching for the right combination to make a dual-purpose gun. They say the, the 4 and, to a certain degree, the 4.5-inch, the stopping power just really isn't enough to take on um, destroyers, even though they do make fairly good anti-aircraft guns. The 4.7-inch is pretty good dual purpose gun but it's uh it's fairly comparable in it's it's uh, probably i'd say a slightly slightly less capable in the aa role compared to the 5 inch 38 but probably a slightly better anti surface gun than the 5 inch 38 but that's cuz it is a slightly longer barreled weapon basically but as a result it is fairly expensive and quite takes quite a bit of space to fit especially if you go for a twin mount. Um, then you've got the 5.25. Now, the British thought they'd got it right with the 5.25, and to a certain degree in the modified turrets on things like Vanguard, um, it did work pretty well. But the the main problem was that you needed really to, well, before the year of auto-loading, you needed to hand-load for rapid fire, and the 5.25-inch shell was just that little bit too heavy. Um for sustained operation. This is why an, until autoloaders came about, a six inch dual purpose gun was really off the table completely, because um, you just couldn't expect people to hand load them fast enough to um, to get uh, anti-aircraft rates of fire out of them. Um, but on top of that, the yeah, there were all sorts of issues with the 5.25 inch turret that, uh, that has fitted on King George V that meant it didn't realize its potential anywhere near as well as it should have done. Um, but anyway, that, that little divergent aside, the basically the pros and the cons come, if you can get a dual-purpose gun, come down to the fact that, as I say, generally, you because the two roles are slightly different, you're either going to have jack-of-all-trades, master-of-none, or weighted slightly more towards one than the other. So you're never going to have um, the ideal weapon for, for both if you use dual-purpose. Um, also, dual-purpose guns individually the mounts are going to be larger and heavier than anti-surface dedicated mounts because of, uh, and they're also going to be slightly slower than perhaps the ideal AA gun of the period might be the ideal AA gun probably being something in the three to four inch caliber and they're going to be slightly slower firing just because of the the bigger size which is necessary for anti-shipping work obviously the pro one of the other pros is that you can fit a lot of the same gun which gives you a fairly large anti-surface uh, battery and a fairly large anti-aircraft battery whereas if you go with two separate ones although your anti-aircraft gun might be a better at being anti-air and your anti-surface gun might be better at being anti-surface unless you absolutely ram the decks full of them 
you're not going to have as many guns doing either job. Um, which obviously could be a problem if you're facing mass air assault, like, I don't know, say most of World War II. Um, the, and obviously you've also got commonality of ammunition. Um, so if you've got a dedicated... This is, well, it's again, swings and roundabouts. If you've got a dual-purpose mount, you can just carry lots of shells in that caliber and you have a mix of high explosive anti-air and possibly anti-armor uh, penetration rounds whereas you can afford to specialize a bit more when you've got separate batteries um and the, i say that the, the the swings and roundabouts part of that is that you, with a dual purpose mount you will only have a portion of your ammunition set aside for those guns which is anti-air ammunition or anti-surface ammunition whereas the entirety of your stock of aa or ap or he ammunition for single purpose guns is going to be um of that correct of the correct caliber uh, sorry, of, it's going to be of the correct type so if you can say take i don't know 300 rounds per gun for single use and 400 for a dual purpose because of the, the space savings you might only have 200 aa rounds for your dual purpose gun but you'll have 300 for your dedicated aa gun so there's that um so yeah pros and cons all over the place um really but one of the major reasons that the Axis powers tended to go for different calibers for secondaries um, for their anti-shipping and anti-air. I mean, yeah, their anti-air, technically, you could use them in anti-shipping, but they te A, they tended to be of that slightly lower caliber, which made them less effective, but also quite a lot of them would be fitted with anti-aircraft fire directors only and not really equipped for anti-surface action. Um, but anyway, the, the main reason was technological. Um, there's a fair bit of work and technology that has to go into a dual-purpose gun, and in that respect, um, the British and the Americans were ahead um, the Americans were probably the furthest ahead, mainly thanks to the fact that the 5-inch 38s they developed worked really well on their destroyers. The British trailing slightly further behind um, and obviously putting a lot of their investment into the 5.25, which didn't work out so well, as I said. Um, although the dual 4.5-inch, which they refitted some of the Queen Elizabeths and the Renown with, was actually a, a superb weapon and probably if they just concentrated on making a better version of that they would have gotten ahead or on a par with the americans in terms of development time for dual purpose medium caliber weaponry so hopefully that gives some answer to that question stop the boats tony asks say by some miracle the u.s knew the exact specs of the yamato as its keel was laid down would someone suggesting a modern tillman class in order to one-up the japanese be taken seriously Probably not, because the Montanas, let's face it, in all likelihood, the Montanas are perfectly adequate to try and deal with the Yamatos. Um, they are not got the kind of margin of super superiority that you'd like, but I, I wouldn't want to put money against a Montana going up that, that was fighting a Yamato. I'd, I'd sit back and enjoy the popcorn with the money I'd saved. Um, but anyway, into all seriousness, if if they'd suddenly been had sort of magical in one hundred percent proof intelligence dropped in on them that this is actually what the Yamato specs were, well, a I think the most likely outcome is they probably would have actually just at, gone and built the Montanas instead of putting them on hold on hold and then cancelling them as they did historically, because um, remember at the time they thought the Yamatos were kind of slightly slower, slightly heavier versions of the Iowas with sixteen inch guns, so. Yeah, if they'd known what they actually were, I rather suspect the Montanas would have gone on the fast track. The other thing that I can see them doing, actually, is digging up one of the previous iteration of Montana designs, one of the ones that went up to just over 80,000 tonnes, because the, those versions um, were just as heavily armoured as Montana, and Montana is pretty much as well armoured as Yamato um, in terms of absolute thickness and in terms of armour scheme better protected um in terms of its whole armor and as i say well 12 16 inch 50 guns versus 9 18.1s it's a wash um obviously the u.s benefits from the better fire control systems and radar and but with that seven that sort of eighty thousand ton plus design as i mentioned in the montana video that 
fires you 33 knots. So rather than having roughly similar tactical speed to a Yamato, you would have effectively a Montana that could keep up with an Iowa, and that would give it uh, sort of that would give it a final decisive edge in terms of having a speed advantage to dictate the engagement. Um, so yeah, they might have dug those out and built a couple to face up against the Yamato, which would be rather entertaining. And now on to the Discord question. So, yeet to your heartbeat. Oh, I guess. Okay, fine, whatever. Um, says, not sure if this has been asked, but why does the US have so many museum battleships compared to other nations? Short answer is you have an awful lot more money than the rest of us do. Um, and more specifically, you have an awful lot more of our money than most of the rest of us do. Uh, that's not me just being facetious either. That's genuinely true. Um... Bear in mind that the US came out of World War One with relatively little war debt for the fairly good, comparative to other countries, um, for the fairly good reason that um, Britain and France had emptied most of their treasuries paying the US for stuff. Um, and the same for World War II. Um, well, France not so much because they caught a sudden case of Wehrmacht, but... Um, Britain spent an awful lot of money, and all that a lot of that money went over to the U.S. So the U.S. came out of both world wars with a ton of Britain's money, um, as well as their own. Uh, so that rather helped their financial situation, um, and uh, meant that by the time you got to the period when the battleships were being decommissioned, well, there there also was the Helpful, helpfully the fact that the US had a lot more modern battleships floating around and obviously a lot of the battleships that are museum ships are the I was obviously lost for a long ages until in service till the 90s 2000s um, but even the South Dakotas and North Carolinas which make up the bulk of the other US museum ships outside of things like Texas and Olympia basically the US had so many ships and a lot of them were relatively recent that they lasted in good enough condition <clears throat> to a point after World War Two, when um, it was economical, economically viable to say yes, we want to m maintain these as museum ships, um, whereas most of the, well, because yeah, the other country, other countries, including Britain, didn't have as much money left over at the end of the World War Two, combined with the fact that a lot of the ships that you would have wanted to preserve, like War Spite or um, whatever, um, were much older, so they were coming out of service a lot sooner. Um, and I think, well, the other thing as well is that a lot, obviously, a lot of these battleships, the states took great pride in having a ship named after them, so there was a little bit more motivation at state government level to keep them, um, keep them around. Whereas with, with the British naming scheme, the we are well county class, we the equivalent, I guess, of U.S. states. Yeah, we name cruisers after those. Um, we don't have any battleships that are like well, HMS London or... Well, we used to have an HMS London way back, but these days we wouldn't. Uh, at that time, we definitely didn't. Yeah, HMS London was a pretty dreadnought. But anyway, um, yeah, at the time, you're talking about things like, well, King George V, he was dead. Um, Anson and Howe, very, very long time dead. Um... <laughs> Uh, Prince of Wales, well, that was sunk. Um, so, yeah, they're not, not really going to put that on as a museum ship. Um, the Duke of York, hereditary position, but the Duke of York is actually named for dead. Um, Vanguard, War Spite, Renown, um, Valiant, etc. They're all concepts, don't tend to have many voting rights or financial backing behind them. Queen Elizabeth I, that is very long dead um not really a lot of pull there so yeah um it would it would have had to been something very special and unfortunately the the ships that were most likely to capture the nation's heart like war spite were pretty clapped out and needed to be got rid of in the late 1940s when nobody had any money so yeah unfortunately that oh yeah one other thing before i forget the us has a lot more space if you take a look at Google Maps at some point, um, look at the satellite view, have a look at somewhere like Portsmouth and try and figure out where the heck you'd put a Vanguard. The yeah, if we, let's let's retire HMS Vanguard and use it as a museum ship. Okay, where exactly are we going to put it? Yeah, we're a little bit smaller, unfortunately. 
VV asks, how are things handled when it comes to kitchen cooking areas in wooden warships? So yeah, cooking with fire on a wooden warship, not exactly going to pass most health, most health and safety assessments these days. Um, so in order to make sure you didn't accidentally set fire to your own warship, um, especially when said warship's carrying a couple of tonne of gunpowder down in the hold fairly near where you are, um, what they would do is they built stoves or galleys deep, deep in the ship um, where it was the most stable and also conveniently underwater. Um, and they would build them un out of brick and within these brick, very well insulated, very well lined stoves, this is where the fires would be set uh, for cooking to be done. This would obviously only be done when the ship wasn't in combat and when the weather was relatively calm. If the weather began to get rough, the fires would have to be doused. Um, and if the ship was entering combat, the fires would have to be doused. And they would make absolutely sure there was no trace of any fire whatsoever present aboard the ship at any time when there was a risk the fire could fall out of the of the um, galley. Or if the ship was in combat, and could be, the fire could then be shot out of the galley. Um, so yeah, that was how they did it, um, and this mystery, to be honest, had plagued a lot of people at the time, um, uh, I mean, of, in terms of study, like how did they do it, and we knew that there were these galleys around, but it was very hard to find evidence of them. Um, one of the earliest ga uh, galleys that was found mostly in situ, albeit not uh, intact, was during the excavation of the wreck of the Mary Rose, where they came across a pile, a random pile of brickwork. And went, why? Why is there this random brickwork in the middle of our nice wooden shipwreck? Um, and then they put two and two together, having a look at the state of some of the bricks and also the material finds that are around there. So yeah, that is how you cook food on a wooden warship without setting yourself on fire, which is always a good thing. AML asks, in a clash of pre-dreadnoughts, how well do you think the German theory of smaller calibre guns with higher rate of fire would actually have held up? I rather suspect not particularly well. Um, even with the 9.4 inch mounts uh, on some of the really early uh, German pre-dreads, and then with the 11 inch mounts on the later ones, their rate of fire wasn't spectacularly greater than the 12 inch guns that you tended to find on most other pre dreads. You maybe might have half around a minute extra fire advantage, but in exchange, you, especially with the 9.4 inch guns, you had a vastly smaller um, window for armor penetration and. With the 11 inch guns, it was kind of like, yeah, you can fire fractionally faster, but again, you've got um, less armor penetration. And also, when you look at the guns themselves, you notice that the um, bursting charges on the German guns for the 11 inch shells are a bit lower than for the 12 inch shells. So, on <clears throat> on a sort of the your typical 12 inch. Uh, shell, you're probably looking at a, somewhere between 11 and 12 uh, kilos of explosive in the bursting charge, and yeah, not really so much in the in the German ones. Um, even once you got onto some of the later uh, German weapons, such as the 11-inch guns used in, let's say, the Nassau and the Von der Tan, um, even when you look at those ships, the bursting charge there is still only pushing nine key just under nine kilos and that is on a so you're talking about about 25 percent less bursting charge and that's on a much more modern gun so you you may be scoring one or two odd extra hits but with an increased chance that they're not going to go through in the first place and even if they do they're not going to do as much damage so yeah i don't think that would have worked out particularly well for them Hood asks, how could the British have done better in some of the major sea battles in World War I? Heligoland by Doggerbank, Jutland, etc. And also, what's the best way to draw the Germans out? Um, in terms of drawing the Germans out, there's precious little you can do other than something insanely risky, like trying to um, attack the German coastline or something like that, because the Germans knew they had the smaller fleet and they were very definitely uh, on orders to engage only when it suited them on their terms. 
the fact that it took until 1916 to see something like Jutland was a product of the fact that up until that point, every time the Germans got any wind that the Grand Fleet was at sea, they went, nope, we're out of here. Um, so if the Grand Fleet was specifically out there waiting for them, they would have just gone, no, we're staying in port. Um, and uh, yeah, Jutland mainly took place because they didn't know that the Grand Fleet was out. In terms of how the British could have done better at various battles, well, my stock answer for Dogger Bank and Jutland is throw Seymour overboard, preferably with BT tied to his coattails. Um, I mean, it's rather glib, but an awful lot of the problems could be solved by that competent signal officers and uh, someone who understood tactics other than, well, charge. I think BT was basically more like a well-spoken Klingon when it came to battle. Very unsubtle and um, rather predictable. Anyways, that said, uh, Dogger Bank specifically, well, again, it comes down to signals. They had Blucher dead to rights, but they uh, they could eat, and Seidlitz was half crippled. So they could quite easily, even though Lion was dropping out of line, with the proper signals, just said, right, okay, maybe Lion and one of the trailing um, older I-type um Battle cruisers can just finish focus on finishing off Blucher. Um, everybody else go piling in on after the rest of the German battle cruisers and take them out, which was actually Beatty's intention. Um, but signals, yeah, Seymour, thanks, uh, and Beatty, thanks for employing him, you muppet. Um, Jutland. About the only thing, well, in, in the daytime battle again signals better training for the for the battle cruiser fleet i yeah don't leave your flash protection don't take your flash protection off and stock tons of ammo in your turrets might help you not go bang um but outside of that in terms of tactics well despite bt and his terrible lack of giving out any useful information jellico pretty much executed the perfect ambush for the high seas fleet the high seas fleet just turned and noped out of there um I suppose Jellicoe could have tried turning into the German torpedo attack to maintain contact um, before darkness fell completely, although that would have been very risky. But if he'd gone for it, in theory, he might have pulled it off and forced a close engagement with the German high seas fleet while it was on its way, um, while it was running away. The other thing would have been the various British ships that spotted and or engaged German ships during the night if they'd actually managed to get word through to Jellicoe so Jellicoe then knew where the German fleet was going because outside of the ships that had been blown up and probably Lion and Warspite the rest of the Grand Fleet was pretty much in fighting trim a lot of the German fleet very definitely wasn't. So if that information had got through to Jellicoe and Jellicoe had therefore been waiting at the right entrance to the German minefields at daybreak the next day, I can't see a lot of the German fleet making it through and it would be a pretty spectacular clash. I mean, yeah, it would cost the British ships as well, no doubt about it, but the German fleet had started out in a tactically worse position and would have been in a far far worse tactical position come daybreak the, it was on the day after Jutland so yeah um, those are the two big ones I mean to be honest Heligolampi is a bit of a mess at the beginning of the war but again the kind of the battle cruisers kind of did their job um, that that was more of a meeting engagement there wasn't there's not really a tremendous amount outside of again just a bit more spare signals discipline although this time it's not Seymour's fault believe it or not um, that they could have done to improve their records there Hood also asks, how would four Admiral class battle cruisers do in World War II and how effective would they be? I have a sneaky suspicion I may have answered a question similar to this before, um, so I'll just briefly cover it here. So, mm, well, it runs into the major issue of how the heck they managed to sneak four Admiral class past the Washington Treaty restrictions um, without everybody else jumping the in, at which point obviously you have... Um, far more butterflies than can ad adequately be answered in a in a short dry dock question response um although to be fair you're talking about the japanese and uh german and american navy so perhaps the german and italian fleet's not going to really have much else to do but okay let's say you've got four admiral class well the, the last three after hood are even more heavily protected um almost a subclass with a fighting strength of 
four ships, you may very well see Renown and Repulse retired early, or you might see the R-Class retired, um, one or the other. Uh, in order to make way for the four admirals under the treaty restrictions, assuming that the same numbers of ships are kept. So you might end up with a, let's to be perfectly honest, you might end up with a battle line that consists of the four admirals, the five Queen Elizabeths, um, Renown and Repulse. And so that makes 11. Yes, my math is correct. Um, at which point you have four hulls left over. Nelson and Rodney are going to be two of them, assuming you somehow manage to get those two in as well, which leaves you with two, so you might end up with a couple of R-Class being kept around for those purposes, um, just to flash out the battle line. I suspect it might go that way more than keeping the R's and ditching Renown and Repulse, because Renown and Repulse would generally a little bit more useful and with four admirals especially with the latter three being more heavily protected you might very well see um hood brought up to their standards if possible and then them forming a fast wing of the battle fleet because then if the r's are kind of put on second line duty then your battle fleet line speed is restricted only by the queen elizabeth's which puts you at advantage over most anyone else um and yeah with four of them it'd be very very tempting to to treat them more as fast battleships rather than as battle cruisers so in terms of how effective they would be well you, you they'd probably see combat losses for obviously um they'd probably end up getting more refits because they wouldn't have to string that out on and on and on like the hood as a centerpiece um you would then probably see the un the less modernized Queen Elizabeths relegated with a couple of remaining R's over to the convoy escort duty and the such that you saw the R class historically used for as a whole, and where whereas um, historically you see uh, the the Queen Elizabeths and Nelson and Rodney being used and even Renown to a great extent being used to plug various um needs during world war ii the admiral class might take the bulk of that burden along with nelson and rodney so where they need a uh, slow blocking force use nelson and rodney where they need um fast battle fleet units they'll probably use the admiral so for example the mediterranean fleet will probably be composed of multiple admiral class instead of a mixture of queen elizabeth's and R class, and then with Queen Elizabeth and R class being used elsewhere, um, which might actually, interestingly enough, lead to the odd situation of as and when the Bismarck breaks out, there may not be an Admiral class around to chase after it because the Admiral class may be running around the Mediterranean, with, going with all sorts of hijinks with the Italian battle fleet. Um, yeah, it's an interesting bit of speculation, and this has taken far too long for something I was only supposed to briefly cover, but anyway. And finally, he Hood also asks, what would be the effects of the British building Design Y instead of the Revenge class? So Design Y, for those of you who don't know, also known as the Super Tigers, um, this was effectively, ironically enough, given the previous question, effectively Hood before Hood was a thing. They were battlecruiser variants of the Queen Elizabeth Dash Revenge class. And so when you look at their statistics, they might might sound to seem eerily familiar. 11-inch um, belt, 8 15-inch guns and 4 twin turrets, 30-knot um, top speed. Yeah, sounding familiar to, similar to Hood? Yeah, that's pretty much because, yeah, they are the, as I say, they are the pre-Hoods. They are the, the battlecruiser variants of the immediate pre-war British battleships. Now, if these, if they built a bunch of these instead of the Revenge class, I mean, it's not going to have a tremendous amount of effect on World War One as a whole, because, well, the only engagement that actually mattered um, at a time when the Revenge class was in service, which was Jutland, there were two of them around, but they didn't get hit, so armor issues and then etc. Aside, um, although that said, if you got two of them in service, you got two thirty-knot battle cruisers with fifteen-inch guns. Scratch that. 
They're not going to be in the battle line, are they? They're going to be in the battle cruiser fleet. Boy, is that going to be a surprise for the Germans. <laughs> that might actually... Might actually um, make BT's command not an entire abject failure because they've got the armour plating to withstand the German shells. Um, well, the, the ammo practices may or may not still be terrible, so you may or may not still see one go up. That would be a complete disaster. Um, but, generally speaking, they are better protected. They're going to be pretty much the fastest things on the field, in terms of capital ships by a long shot. And they're going to have some pretty nasty firepower. So yeah, actually, that could have a that could ha have a fairly dramatic effect on Jutland um, if they're running around, um, especially if they manage to uh, damage, slow down, cripple, etc. One or more German battle cruisers before Fifth Battle Squadron shows up to finish them all off. Now, actually, if they're building these, given that Fisher wanted battle cruisers, that's how Renan and Repulse showed up. If they do end up building these instead of the Revenge class, you might actually see all of them completed, including Resistance. So you might have a class of eight battle cruisers floating around with pretty decent armor. Now that's again a very interesting counterfactual going forward because if you've got eight of those plus five Queen Elizabeth plus Nelson and Rodney, that is a fifteen-inch battle line straight off. And again, kind of similar to the Admiral class, but actually possibly even more so, the Queen Elizabeths are now the slow pokes of the family. Um, they're the slowest, and unlike Nelson and Rodney, um, who are roughly about the same speed, um, they don't have nine 16 inch guns. These design Y dash Super Tiger dash alternate revenge classes, they've got speed, they've got decent armor, not brilliant, but. I mean, looking at 11 inches, it's all right. Um, but they also have firepower. So I suspect that what you will see in the interwar period is that these ships will be brought into the battle line um, and that they will probably get significant up armoring. Um, they'll probably, they will obviously have to be modernized with new boilers. So the new boilers extra power will probably offset the the torpedo bulges and the extra armor that they've got to have so they might they might drop a knot or two in speed overall but they they still retain a fairly high speed now this actually met that makes world war 2 very interesting because all of a sudden actually it's going to influence that's going to influence post uh, the treaty battleship design as well because if they manage by using um modern boilers to keep their top speed then all of a sudden the british have a significant battle force capable of 30 knots and if you've got a bunch of fairly mo well modernized battleships cruising around at 30 knots then the treaty era battleships are going to have to match that um they're not going to be able to uh sit back and go well 28 knots is fine um and that's going to affect treaty battleship design massively. Um, they're going to have to put more emphasis on speed, which means more length, which means more displacement, which means that you're probably going to see you're probably going to see ships maybe be armed with eight to ten guns, probably fourteen to fifteen inch instead of the sixteen, fifteen to sixteens that you see historically. Armor wise, obviously, it's going to be proportional to that so yeah actually this is gonna it's gonna have a huge ripple effect um be a very interesting one actually it'd be it, it would be highly highly dependent on exactly how what they could do in terms of up armoring them because you know, 11 inches of belt armor is all right for world war one but you definitely need to upgrade that for world war two so the interwar year armor uprating is going to be critical and that brings us to the end of this week's dry dock episode so i'm hope you all enjoyed it greatly and uh, thank you very much for watching and if you're watching this in the uh, weekend of release or shortly thereafter keep an eye out for this wednesday's video i think you're going to enjoy it a lot uh, hopefully you've been enjoying the other videos a lot but i think you will particularly like this one thank you very much for watching and on that very cryptic note i will see you next time